Happy 2024 and welcome to Pondering the Orb. I'm the wandering fantasy author Jay Reckward, and this is a show about riffs, scents, and fantasy books. So sit back, subscribe, like, and hit that notification bell. Time for a new year of adventures into books and music. Our first book is the inaugural collection of short stories written by Fritz Lieber and starring his greatest characters, Fafford and the Grey Mouser. This is Swords and Deviltry. Titans of the Sword and Sorcery genre, these two rogues spawned multiple copies of their infamous partnership, blessed by the dark forces of Lankmar, but few match these originals. Lieber's penchant for smart, warm humor atop of the intense action is always present, and reading these stories is a pleasure. They are so well wrought they seem seamless, and Lieber knew how to write a great fight scene. Taken from the Induction, a classic vignette by the legendary Fritz Lieber, this is Swords and Deviltry, starring Fafford and the Grey Mouser, first published in 1970. Swords and Deviltry, Fafford and the Grey Mouser, Book One, by Fritz Lieber. Story the First, Induction. Sundered from us by gulfs of time and stranger dimensions dreams the ancient world of Nawan, with its towers and skulls and jewels, its swords and sorceries. Nawan's gnome realm crowds through the inner sea, northward the green-forested fierce lands of the eight cities, eastward the steppe-dwelling mingle horsemen in the desert where caravans creep from the rich eastern lands in the river Tilith. But southward, linked to the deserts only by the sinking land and further warded by the great dike and mountains of hunger, are the rich grain fields and walled cities of Lankmar, eldest and chiefest of Nawan's lands. Dominating the land of Lankmar and crouching at the silty mouth of the river Lal, in a secure corner between the grain fields, the Great Salt March, and the inner seas is the massive walled and mazy alley metropolis of Lankmar, thick with thieves and shaven priests, lean framed magicians, and fat bellied merchants. Lankmar the Imperishable, the city of the Black Toga. In Lankmar on one murky night, if we can believe the runic book of Shielbel of the Eyeless Face, there met for the first time these two dubious heroes and whimsical scoundrels, Falfred and the Grey Mauser. Fafrid's origins were easy to perceive in his near seven-foot height and liber-looking ranginess, his hammered ornaments and huge longsword. He was clearly a barbarian from the cold wastes north even of the Eight Cities and the Troll Step Mountains. The Mouser's antecedents were more cryptic, and hardly to be deduced from his childlike stature, gray garb, mouse skin hood shadowing flat, swart face, and deceptively dainty rapier. But somewhere about him was the suggestion of cities in the south, the dark streets and also the sun-drenched spaces. As the twain eyed each other challengingly through the murky fog lit indirectly by distant torches, they were all dimly aware that they were two long-sundered, matching fragments of a greater hero, and that each had found a comrade who would outlast a thousand quests in a lifetime, or a hundred lifetimes, of adventuring. No one at that moment could have guessed that the Grey Mauser was once named Mouse, or that Fafford had recently been a youth whose voice was training high-pitched, who were white furs only, and who slept in his mother's tent, although he was eighteen. Appearing on both of my recent episodes celebrating the debut of New Edge Sword and Sorcery number one and two, Kirk A. Johnson is a Trinidad-born author living here in the great city of New York. The founder of his own publishing house, Farfield Press, he first released Obanox and Other Tales of Heroes and Horrors in 2022, and has continued to capture attention for his inventive storytelling, which highlights his study of West Africa and the Sahel. He is a fantastic writer with a real verb for atmosphere, and this collection of two novellas and two shorts is a constant thrill ride between action and distinctive inventive horror. Reading from the novella of the same name, this is taken from Obanox and Other Tales of Heroes and Horror by Kirk A. Johnson. Please enjoy. The Obanox by Kirk A. Johnson By the time they entered the burial chamber, the two moons, Koi and Ki, had come out to illuminate the valley in a dim glow, doing little to extinguish the darker shadows that seemed so much blacker than would be expected. Rory was the last to enter, but stopped short and turned to face the ruined monuments that had once towered proudly into the sky. 
Even before the now glorious Zanjarnu Empire held sway over the world, Wata was once a city of bright and tall towers that had now become hills of rubble fallen to time, silent and dead, but not entirely forgotten. All knew that the great pyramid tombs of Wata, only a day's wide from Zawar, were once the monumental homes of the wealthiest and most noteworthy dead. That was, of course, before time and civil strife chewed them up into mounds of stone and dust, with only a few still retaining their arched entrances. But then again, do the dead truly care about the condition of their final resting place? Some would say yes, but certainly not those she now traveled with, hungrily searching to loot the once opulent catacombs. It didn't take them long to shovel aside the dirt and debris, finding a vast chamber with arching walls and short, stout stone pillars. Though no one could read the inscriptions adorning its surface, it didn't matter to the only two who could. Education and ancient lore was not their purpose. Ancient gold was. And its absence did not go unmentioned. There's nothing here, grumbled Quick as his lanky frame crept further into the chamber. We've been duped. I tell you, there's a great treasure. You see any treasure? Silver chains, jeweled rings, a chest filled with gold zoos. The grumbling grew louder until Baku, their leader, ordered mosquitoes to smash the stone marker into movable pieces and throw them into the shadows. As their flickering torches lit the chamber, they started digging, refusing to mention their disappointment in not finding anything of immediate value. Thanks to the torchlights, the grave robbers showed their bravado and little consideration for the eternal sleep of Wata's most excellent cadavers. Someone bet they would purchase and outperform both host and hostess at Zawar's oldest pleasure manor if only he had the Zors. Then someone else responded, though that was probably how most of the dead got there in the first place. A great guffaw echoed over worry shoulders, drowning out the scraping of iron shovels and picks. Psst, worry snarled, turning to the burly man they called Mosquito. Digging up a grave is bad enough, but making noises and joking about it is just plain bad manners. Though Worry was small-framed compared to the others, especially Mosquito, her braided line of hair and bronze nose ring marked her not as a citizen of Zuar, but of Ashua, a people deemed to have barbaric ways and respectful regard for the dead. And wearing a dirty old caftan helped hide her broad shoulders and powerfully lean physique. Luckily for her, they knew nothing about her exceptional hearing, a talent that saved her more times than she could remember. Who are you, shushing Quick whispered, pausing in mid-dig to wipe the sweat from his brow. When he realized he was whispering, he decided to change his tone. There's no one here but the dirt and broken stones. The dead are easily roused, Worry whispered back, before looking at the hole they made to get into the burial chamber. Though the entrance was big enough for them to slip through, it now looked small, cramped. It felt as if the jagged breach was slowly closing itself off refusing to allow the cool night breeze to relieve him of the mugginess of the burial pit. If Mosquito's farting hadn't awakened the dead by now, then we really have nothing to worry about. True talk, Bruda, Saiku laughed, waving his hand over his nose at Mosquito. I really wish you hadn't eaten that curry goat before we came out here. It's rude to tell a man what to eat and when, Mosquito responded, sucking his teeth before releasing another burping toot from his ass. Quick began to dig again. Smells worse now than when he was doing out in the sun. Shut up, called Baku, off to the side. Worry carefully watched Baku wipe the sweat from his mustache as he rose with a curse and adjusted the sword tucked in his belt. Baku, Mosquito grinned. You scared of ghosts? No, Baku said, staring down at the three men and one woman in the freshly desecrated grave. But the longer you fool around, the longer it'll take to get into what's buried underneath. By then, the sun will be up, and someone will see us, Worry chimed in, nodding to the sound of their pack animals just outside the entrance. I said, shut up and keep digging. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even know about this grave, Worry protested. If it wasn't for me, you would be doing this all alone, and you don't seem built for this kind of labor. Worry turned away and grinned to herself. She had been in disguise long enough that her true nature was convincingly concealed by all the city folk who met her. As far as they were concerned, she was some bush rat that made her meet in the low-level rip-and-run, stealing and running, like the hyenas of the broad savanna. Not one of any real significance. A vibrating ring alerted them as Mosquito's great shoulders brought his shovel down several times, causing the chamber to fill with a disturbing chime of metal on stone. Worry Quick and Saiku went over to him and helped him dig out the sides of a large stone box as Baku stood over the lip of the pit with two torches in hand. 
Worry looked up at him. His lips curled, and the light of the torches danced within the glassy reflection of his pupils. She knew the look. All city dwellers had it. They could never hide the greed, the desire, the constant wanting that burned within their souls. She watched the others scrambling over the slowly revealed slab chest, licking their lips as sweat streaked down their dirty faces. The grotesque nature of who they were became more apparent as their labor bore fruit, and the whole of a sarcophagus revealed itself to them. The top was plain, as were the sides, an unadorned stone box absent of carving or inscriptions, except for a small symbol gouged at the head of the lid, a circle within the circle, coiling itself endlessly into its center. Worry bit her lip to stifle the awe-filled wonder of her exhale. It was an ancient mark whose lore was passed down to secret knowledge, but only to the chiefs of her tribe, the chiefs and their descendants. Lore passed down from generation to generation, even before the forging of bronze, or even before the Ungulu Ishkas gifted the Shula with the Obanax. This man was a debtor, one who was cursed with paying back the ancestors who heeded the call, the ones who died to save the world from the children of Delit, and Azau. And this tomb is still considered ancient by today's counting, so he must have been the last of his people, with such a heavy toll to pay. She wasn't surprised. Baku, over here. I found its bevel, cried Mosquito. Good and wide. And here, Saiku called out from the other side. If Mosquito puts his back into it, he can lift the lid open from his side. Quick shuffled over to Mosquito's side and stabbed the head of his shovel into the sliver of a gap as Mosquito spit into his hands and began to lift the lid. As he grunted, the lid groaned and creaked. Biceps bulged, slowly forcing the stone cover to rise by the sheer strength of Mosquito's arms, shifting dirt off its undecorated stone top. Worry and Saiku went over then and began to lift as well, exerting themselves as if their lives depended on it. Baku, standing over his companions, brought the torches closer to them, shedding more light on what a thousand years would finally uncover. A cloud of foul, moldy air blew into their faces as the casket's lid rose with a final groaning of stone on stone to finally tip over to one side with a grating crash over the pit's wall. Baku brought the torches over, handing one to Saiku and the other to Quick. Inside, a dusky corpse grinned absently at them. Its one fine basin cloth robe was now torn and discolored over a blackened skeletal frame covered in layers of powdered grime. Its clawed hands clutched a large ceramic tube to its chest. Quick stabbed into the gaps between the corpse and the coffin with a shovel, hoping to hear that familiar ring of wealth underneath. Bones cracked under his less than careful search, causing its head to shift to the side and its mouth to fall open. Saiku sighed, shaking his head. There's nothing here, cried Mosquito. Nothing! No, no, no. Quick dropped his torch and began digging again inside the stone casket with his hands. Maybe the treasure was buried around the casket. Maybe here. He began searching outside the sarcophagus and against the pit walls, angrily throwing dirt everywhere, hoping to feel the cool touch of precious metal. Worry moved closer to the corpse. She gingerly pulled back each dusty digit, freeing the cylindrical container from its grip. A sigh exhaled between the cadaver's open mouth, like a dry wind before the coming of a storm and she swore she heard it say, Ibdos na tempa. It was a sign from the dead, and though it confirmed she was in the right place, she couldn't help stop the chill brushing up her spine. Baku snatched it from her and walked away from the corpse to inspect the tube's surface. It was just a plain stone canister sealed with wax at both ends. After brushing off the dust and grime of an age-old sleep, he broke it against the edge of the coffin, shattering it midsection. Hidden inside was a rolled-up piece of lambskin. He trembled when he noticed that it showed no sign of rot. Saiku moved closer with his torch. It's a scroll case. A map, maybe? A map, definitely. Baku moved closer to the entrance and held the unfurled parchment as Saiku's flame followed him. His eyes focused on the symbol's markings written in faded black ink as a slight breeze cooled his face. The words, not in Zarka. It's an older language, I think. So we'll need someone to read it. A scholar? One of the Jangakats of Zuar? People we don't know, Huff Mosquito. See what you get listening to this one, 
He jabbed a thumb over in Worry's direction. It's not worthless, Worry said. It's a map to the Obanox. Quick stopped digging and rushed over to Saiku's side. What's that? It sounds priceless. Our first scent selection comes from an Irish sorcerer located in northern Spain, and like both of his homelands, his music captures an astounding beauty. Neil Sir is a tremendous composer with a wonderful selection of synthwave that needs to end up in your player. A dynamic musician who knows how to soar with his intense melodies, his craft is possessed by a sincere cinematic element and a sense to express it with deafness. This track is called Lotus Land, a 2023 single brought to us by Neil Sir.
it is a distinct honor and privilege to play music from this next band. Melodic death metal serves as the basis for many other genres outside of itself in the scope of heavy music, and without a doubt it has had indelible effects on folk metal. However, when you're a young lad born to Celtic heritage from the Isles or the continent, you gravitate towards people retelling the stories of your ancestors. Elveti tells those kind of stories, blending an intense study of ancient Gallic language, Celtic folk music, and culture with melodic death metal to create a body of work that has enraptured audiences for two scorching decades and I'm obviously a giant fan of this band. Taken from their album 2019's Antignatos, this is Deathwalker from Switzerland's Elveti.
Thank you so much for joining me for this episode as we enter 2024. But before we go, some quick reminders. Our next episode is the season two finale. We're going to have great books and music as always, but also some big announcements. Also, look what arrived. These are the print paperback versions of New Edge Sword and Sorcery number one and two, and how fantastic are these? Every single story in these issues are worth your ducats, so please check out these magazines and the links to the episodes where they're covered below. And of course, subscribe, like, and hit that notification bell. I'll see you again soon. Safe journeys, my friends. Thank you.